Submit, pray, and honor. These are the things we looked at last week as we saw what God had to say about how we look at those in authority. That when we look at government, we look at people in charge, God has things to say about it because God, God says that this is a gift to us from Him. And when we look at authorities, we, we honor them and respect because it shows an honor and an obedience toward God. And so we, we discussed how, how well, thinking about politics isn't an inherently bad thing. It's a good thing. It's something that should be on our mind as it is a gift from God. And, and that if you want to be involved in politics even, that, that can be an honorable thing to do to God's glory because it is a gift from God. It, it's a gift because through it, God wants to provide for his people. He wants to provide a, a, a peaceful society so that the church, well, we can be the church. We can love sinners with the grace of God and, and bring the message of the gospel that transforms people's hearts. We can do that because the, the government is called to do something differently. They're called to provide consistently law and order and peace and justice by again consistently punishing the bad and committing the good. This is what they're to do. And we give thanks to God for it. But what happens when they don't? What happens when they don't consistently punish the bad and commend the good, but instead punish the good and commend the bad? What happens when there isn't law and order and there isn't peace and justice? What happens when the church isn't free to be the church and to pro proclaim the gospel and, and love people the grace of God? What happens then? Well, thankfully, when we look at God's word, we see this often. <laughs> We see God's people living under governments that we wouldn't call good. Living in societies that had people in charge that were not God-pleasing and did not do God-pleasing things. We saw children of God living under people who abused their power. And what did they do? How did they go about it when we're called to to submit, pray, and honor. What do you do when somebody looks like they don't deserve those things and, and they certainly are, are calling on, on us to obey or, or honor things that God does not like? What do we do? Well, today we're going to look to what might be a familiar story for you. It might not be, but it's the first of many accounts in Bible history that Things that happen, real people dealing with this very question. And we're actually going to look at a few different topics tonight, but, but to start with, we're going to look at a time when, when God's people lived under a man named King Nebuchadnezzar. And, and he did not like always peace and justice. In fact, he was, he was the most powerful man in the world at the time of our reading. He had conquered the Assyrian Empire and put them down. And he had dragged God's people away after destroying the temple in Jerusalem and, and taken them, and taken the best and brightest even, and placed them in his government. A government that did not worship God or honor God or love God, certainly loved and honored all sorts of pagan gods. And as a result, King Nebuchadnezzar, well, he was pretty full of himself. <laughs> He didn't necessarily care about keeping peace and justice in the land. He cared about how he looked. And because of that, he, he built a 90-foot golden statue that he wanted people to honor because he wanted to be number one in people's lives. He wanted people to look to him and respect him and honor him most of all to the detriment of their own faith even. And the threat was put out there that if anybody didn't honor and respect him above all and do what he said, 
they would be thrown into a fiery furnace and killed. It didn't matter if that was a peaceful thing or if justice was done in Nebuchadnezzar's eyes. What mattered was himself. And so what did God, God's people do? God's people did what, what God's people have to do, and, and they spoke up. Three of God's people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, spoke up to this King Nebuchadnezzar and told him what was right and told him what is true. But how did they do it? Let's turn to God's word now. I invite you to follow along as I read from Daniel chapter 3. And we'll see how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't just countercultural to what they cared about. But they showed a counter countercultural way to go about it. Starting with verse 9, as, as some of Nebuchadnezzar's chief advisors came to him, this is what they said. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down in worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. This is the word of God. So what did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do? Three men who were known to be honorable, hard workers in the government. What did they do? When faced with worshiping an idol and standing up for worship for their God, the decision was easy. Even with the threat against their lives involved, they could only do and stand up for what they knew was right. Which is to not bow down to an idol, even if it seemed like it would save their lives. They needed to only worship God, and it didn't matter who knew about it. But do you notice how they went about it? <laughs> when Nebuchadnezzar talked to them, how did they talk back? You notice what they said twice. They called the majesty twice. They knew that in this matter, they did not rule over their faith, but he was still king. He was still their boss. He was still an authority. And they treated with him with honor and respect. You might ask yourselves, but, but how could they do this when he was being so unfair? This was clearly not a just command. In fact, the Babylonian Empire was known for a lot of the times tolerating faith groups. How could he now change policy in this way? This, this seemed to go against what they typically did. How could, he, how could he give such an unjust command? And the fact is, by, by standing up to him, they were showing that this was not justice. This was, this was an injustice that King Nebuchadnezzar was doing, but they still... They still showed him respect. Now how could they do it? <laughs> how could they both say that you are wrong and this is, this is not right, 
but yet you are your majesty. How could they, how could they do that? Perhaps they remembered their worship songs. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, faithful worshipers. Maybe they were, remembered their worship song, songs from the Psalms. Maybe they remembered a verse from the Psalm that we said earlier today. When they said, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Maybe they remembered how it, they could be treated however Nebuchadnezzar or those those abusers of power in his court, no matter what they did to them, God would work justice. No matter who was wearing a crown in front of them or sitting on a throne in a palace, they knew that, that God was Lord over all. And then ultimately, his righteousness, his justice is in charge and nobody can change that. You'll notice how King Nebuchadnezzar kind of mocked them and said, I, I am the one in command. Who could possibly save you from my hand? I hold the power. And those three men said right back, just like Jesus to Pontius Pilate, you, you don't know who truly has power, do you? But for all of your armies and all of your wealth and for as grand of your palace is, God can rescue us. He, he has that power. But you notice what else they said, didn't you? That even if, even if God would not use his power to save them from that physical furnace, from that act of injustice, it did not make God any less in charge and any less loving of his people. That no matter what they saw, they knew that justice would be served. Perhaps they recalled how prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah, they called on, the God, on God's people and said that as you go into exile, know that the people who take you away, they'll, they'll receive judgment themselves someday. That no matter what they do to you, God's justice will be served. I think they remembered God's promises. But then you might ask yourself, well, how could they, how could they even serve in a government like that? How could, they, how could they keep calling Nebuchadnezzar his majesty? How could they work for him when he was so unjust? Well, as they probably remembered words like Jeremiah, as, as he talked about the judgment that would come even on Babylon, they probably remembered his other words like this. That as prophets were talking about how, how Babylon would not be in charge long, God's people's time in exile wouldn't last, Jeremiah said this, Do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and you will live. Why should this city become a ruin? That God called on his people, even, even a, a government that, that had destroyed the temple, the fact is, is that they deserve their Submission, their prayers, and their honor. That their lack of justice, Nebuchadnezzar's lack of justice, did not take that away. That they should absolutely stand up for what is right, stand up for their God. And that would look countercultural and radical and weird to the culture around them, absolutely. They would stand out for what they loved and what they cared about. But the other thing that would stand out about them is how they did it. That they would love what is right, but then they would do what is right to those in authority. And that the respect and honor that they had to show did not change just because the people in charge changed. Now, this might seem like an extreme circumstance. Looking at Daniel 3 and Nebuchadnezzar and the exile in Babylon, this might seem unique, but it's not. This was not the only time that God's people had to serve under people who abused their power and did not always keep law in order and did not always fight for, what is pe for, for peace and justice. 
Even before God's people were taken into exile, God's people had their own rulers, their own kings. And God's, God's people's first king, King Saul, he started off well. He loved his God and he took care of his people and, and he was a good king, but it went south. It, it especially changed a lot when, when there was a terrorist against his people, Goliath, a Pharisee, who, who threatened God's people, and, and the person who defeated him wasn't Saul. It, it was a young, a young man, he, he, even almost a boy, David. And as David defeated Goliath and people stopped singing Saul's praises and started singing David, David's praises, Saul went nuts. He tried to kill David with his own hand. He tried to put David in a trap even though David had done no wrong. He had broken no laws. This was not justice when, when Saul threatened David's life. And in fact, Saul used his people's resources, his soldiers, his time to try to chase down David unjustly, to hunt him down and kill him. And, and there was one time when, when Saul almost, almost had David. He was right on his heels. And as Saul and his men took a break and, and Saul went off by himself to use the bathroom in a cave all alone, what he didn't know was that David and his men were in the back of that very cave in the darkness. And David's men told him that this was the time to end the injustice. To kill Saul and be done with him. To end this madness and, and for things to be good again, that man has to die. You have to kill him. And so what David did, David, David crept up. He snuck. David was a warrior. He was a hunter. He knew how to sneak. But instead of, of cutting Saul, he cut a piece of cloth off Saul's robe. He spared Saul's life. But even then, that, that wasn't good enough for David to not just spare Saul's life. Even, even that disrespect that he showed to Saul weighed on David's conscience. This is what happened after that. Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid me that should I do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. The fact is, is that David would go out and reveal himself to Saul and say what he did, but then he went on to tell Saul that this was madness, that this was not good, that he wasn't... He was under threat of not David's judgment, but God's judgment. He spoke up to Saul, but he respected him. He gave him the honor that was due him as king. He spoke up for what was right, but, but he did right. Now again, this, this maybe seems like a unique circumstance, because the fact is that Saul was the Lord's anointed, right? Right? This was a king of Israel, and that was a unique place and a unique time. But God's people didn't stop dealing with unjust rulers and abuses in power. The Apostle Paul, he, he dealt with abuse of power. <laughs> he lived in a time when the high priest named Ananias was, was known for his abuse of power. And in fact, Ananias would eventually be killed by his own people because of how much he abused his power and hurt his people. He had even been put on trial uh, by the Roman government earlier for being so obviously corrupt. He did not do good as a ruler. He did not promote law and order. He did not live in such a way as to promote peace and justice. And when the Apostle Paul was brought before him on trial for, for, simply, for simply speaking the gospel, Paul, who was a good citizen, who did no wrong other than simply tell about the love of God for all people and, and the resurrection that Jesus had come to win, he stood before him, before Ananias, and this is what happened. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. 
Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, How dare you insult God's high priest? And Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest. For it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Maybe his back and forth is a little surprising there. So, some people speculate based on this and, and some, some other things in Paul's writings that Paul's eyesight wasn't very good. That that was his thorn in the side that he spoke of. Because the fact is, is that Paul knew his rights. He knew them well. In, in Acts chapter 22, the, the chapter before this one, he, he spoke to what he was owed as a Roman citizen and as a Jew. That he could not be just arrested because somebody wanted him to. That they couldn't chain him up or abuse him. That was not right. That was not justice. And he let people know it. And that when, when he was put on trial in front of the Sanhedrin, who, who, who should have been God's people's leaders, who, who should have known better, he let them know that they were a whitewashed wall, that they might look good on the outside, but they were garbage. He let them know what he thought. But then what did he do? He realized that, that as he speaks to someone in authority, they are due respect and honor. Not because they're so just, not because they're so good, but because of what we talked about last week, that if authority comes from God and that they are our gift to us, then it's on us to honor and respect them, even if they don't honor and respect us. It doesn't mean Paul stayed silent. He went on to talk about what was right after these verses. But he did it in a much different tone. He spoke, but then he submitted. This is what God's people did again and again and again. That they spoke up for what was right. They knew what God loves and they loved it. They knew what God's hated and they hated it. And they knew that, that the people in charge, people with authority aren't supposed to abuse their power, but they're supposed to do what is right. They're supposed to maintain law and order and peace and justice consistently. And, and so they spoke up when things were wrong. But then they submitted. But what about finally, what about when, when those in charge are just so obviously godless? They have no connection to the church. They have no connection to what even might be remotely peace and, peaceful and just. They, in fact, even look like the cause of what is wrong. Well, again, we don't have to look far in God's word to find it. it the New Testament church existed at a time under an emperor named Nero. And even, even by Roman standards, pagan standards, Nero was unjust and unfair and cruel. That the murder and torture he did to people in his court, what he did to his citizens, and that eventually he would try to pin the blame on Christians for the fires of Rome that he probably started he was as unjust as it comes. And according to church tradition even, it, it seems like Nero was the one responsible for the crucifixion of the Apostle Peter and the beheading of the Apostle Paul. But what did Peter and Paul say about him? What did Peter and Paul say about how God's people are to exist in a culture of ruling authorities who are unjust. Peter said this. He said, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. 
Apostle Peter knew that there were foolish and ignorant people out there. People who said things that were not true and did things that were unwise. And he knew that the people in charge, they were there too. The emperor was definitely behind it. Peter never says to be quiet. Peter never says not to stand up for what is right. But he does say, stand up and then submit. And that by doing so, you, you do good. By doing so, you, you present something that doesn't just point out countercultural truth, but a countercultural life. That the way to silence those ignorant people and the foolish talk and the abuse of power is to act in a way that is unexpected. That lives in a way that shows that I, I don't agree with you and I know you are wrong, but I know that ultimately you are not finally in charge. I will respect you and honor you, but... I, I don't live in fear. I get to live in trust. And when we remove the fear from our lives, and we know that we get to live in trust of, of our God who is in charge above all, who has authority over all, whose will is done ahead of all, then we get to show it differently. We will look differently than everybody. <laughs> We won't just align with those who sometimes agree with what we love and hate, but we're also going to look differently as we speak up about the things that we love and that we know is wrong. And the Apostle Paul maybe defines this best. When he, when he maybe in Romans 13 talked, what we looked at last week, about how government is a gift and, and we, we honor it, we submit to it, and we pray for it. But before it, he, he talks this way. In chapters 12, he says this. He says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. When it is hardest to not just speak up for what is good, but then to also do what is good, we remember what the Apostle Paul says. That good is never accomplished through evil. That God's will is never done when we try to go about God's will in the way that somebody who doesn't know God or love God or believe that they are loved by God, when we go about it the same way that they do, that is not good. We might even align with some of the things that other people talk about it, but when they do it in a way that does not, does not do good in return, does not show respect and honor in return, then then we can't act the same way as them. Just as we, we can't act like bad things are good and good things are bad, we, we, we can't look like we agree with them. Neither way is the way that a child of God lives. Because we love what God loves. And that means we, we want to live in the way that God loves too. And so we speak up, and then we submit. And it's going to mean we're going to stick out, and we're going to put ourselves out there when we speak up. And it's going to feel like a target is on our back, and we are setting ourselves up for danger, hurt, or rejection. But that's when we remember that, that when we fear rejection, when we fear the culture around us, that that's when we remember that God is in control. That God has accepted us already in his kingdom. We're part of his kingdom. And so we don't have to be afraid of the earthly kingdom around us because God's kingdom is greater. We can speak up and then submit in trust. 
And so we can speak up for the things that, that, that are good, that are right. When we see peace being forgotten, when we see injustice being avoided, we can speak up. We can speak up about racism. We can speak up when we see people mistreated because the culture that they're from, the place that they're from, or how they, they look, we can speak up for those things. And wouldn't it be a blessing if the Christian church, God's people, consistently spoke about peace and justice in that way? That with one voice and consistently we could speak to this thing and there would be no confusion about what we value and how we love, that, that we love in the way that God's gospel loves, which is all, for all people. That we would take the time to listen if somebody's experiences are different than our own. Our own. That we wouldn't, we wouldn't put words in their mouth, but we would want to hear what, what they have to say because we love how God loves. Wouldn't it be a gift to this world if we were consistent like that? Because I bet then we could be a gift in another way and be consistent in such a way that we love law and order. That people who serve in our communities as police officers would never have to fear putting on a badge. That their families wouldn't have to say such nervous prayers when they go to be a blessing in the community. If we consistently supported and gave thanks for law and order, can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine how people would listen at this time? It, it, imagine if, if we if we kept consistently speaking up about about how unjust it is that that the people who are most vulnerable in our society, the unborn, that that they're not treated even as well as an unborn bald eagle, that, that if we were to consistently speak up about that, that people could pay attention, but also that we would be consistent about how we treat others who, who are born. That even a doctor at a Planned Parenthood would learn to give thanks to have a Christian as a neighbor. And that somebody who has had an abortion would know that the children of God, Christians, that we, we would love to be there for them and, and show that forgiveness is for them too. That even this thing is a thing that Jesus was born and died for. And that they belong in God's family just as much as us. Wouldn't it, I, I wonder how, how much more a pagan and a godless society might, might listen if we were consistent with both truth and and grace. And we didn't just speak truth no matter what, but we, we spoke truth and grace. And, and there's so many things that we could talk about specific topics, but, but maybe it's enough to look back at, at those different situations in the Bible to see why is it, why is it that the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, and David, why is it that, that they could both speak up and submit? Well, it's, it's the word that we talk about so often here. It's grace. They knew the grace showed to them first. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that they came from Judah, that the whole reason they were in exile is because God's people had been unfaithful to God, and yet God preserved his people. They knew that they received grace. King David himself would go on to abuse power himself in his own reign as king. He would misuse his authority and yet he would receive grace, God's forgiveness. The Apostle Paul, when he was known as Saul, he used his authority to hunt down Christians for nothing else other than their faith and lock them up and even saw them stoned to death. And yet Jesus appeared to him. And called him to be a message of God's grace. The grace that he received, he knew he could freely give. Even to those in authority. And that's how we live too. That the reason we're able to speak up and submit, the reason we're able to look at evil and know that the only way it's overcome is through good is because we know that when God saw us, he is honest and speaks up about our evil in our lives.
He knows our sin, he sees our sin, and he does not stay quiet about it. And yet, he gives us good. He gives us the goodness of the death of his one and only son, who alone was innocent, who uh, alone should have been free from any harm. That's what would have been just, and yet he died for us to give us God's goodness, to know that God's goodness wouldn't be taken away from us at a moment's notice, but it's something that, that belongs to us forever. That as we struggle with interacting with people in authority, as we struggle to be consistent with both truth and grace, God gives us grace, and that is his truth. Because he has given us God's Son. And with a blessing and goodness as good and big as that, we know we have been given enough to give back. We've received enough to open up our hands to shower the grace on those around us. And as we speak up for what is true and we are willing to show grace, especially to those that would least expect it, that's when we start living probably the most politically incorrect lives of all. Amen. Let's, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is only by remembering the grace that you showed us that we are filled with the grace to show to others. And so we give thanks to you for the forgiveness we receive, for the love you show us consistently, even though we are so often inconsistent ourselves. Give us a faithful trust in you, strengthen our trust in you, so that we speak up the truth when it is time to speak, and yet we submit and show your grace to those who need it. Only by your grace is this possible. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.